schadenfreude. Everybody must have screamed, ah, he's a sung hero. A little pushy pushy. Are you back from listening to Stairway to Heaven twice? Now those are just words I looked up on the internet. Unreasonable Doubt, a podcast about West Virginia University basketball, starts now. From a hotel room in beautiful Raleigh, North Carolina, this is Unreasonable Doubt. It's a podcast about West Virginia University basketball. I'm Josh Witt. What a difference a year makes. About one year ago, they took that loyalty picture, the social media team for WVU basketball. Remember the five guys returning? One year later, it's totally different. And are they going to do another loyalty picture this year? They will not. And why wouldn't they? Why? I mean, maybe they will, but they probably won't. I'm guessing more moves are coming. West Virginia University in 2023, in the off season, they're moving and they're shaking. And they're shaking and they're moving. And they're, hey, we called this guy. Hey, we've been in contact with this guy. Very active, very active. All of the activities happening in the transfer portal. More moves are coming. Remember, Ethan Bach, if you haven't listened to my interview with Ethan last week, a.k.a. West Virginia University Woj, he predicted neither Kobe Johnson nor Seth Wilson will be on the roster next season. That was a guess. That's an informed guess. But if they did the loyalty picture today, it would be double the guys. Ten guys in the picture right now. I don't think it's going to be ten. I don't think it's going to be ten. But right now it would be. And if they took that picture today, they'd have to go panoramic. And that's a way better feeling. Ten is greater than five. And even with the moving and the shaking, if they want to take the loyalty picture at some point, that picture is going to have more than five guys. So let's get caught up on the transactions. Jose Perez joined the team during the season, didn't get to play, coming back in. Omar Silvario recruited, needs a waiver technically, but nobody's given an impression that that's going to be a problem in. Here's the weird one that I forgot to mention during last week's episode. Jimmy Bell still has a basketball scholarship, still with WVU. How do I know he's still with WVU? He's got football pads on. (laughs) My man Jimmy Bell has been given the opportunity to practice with the Mountaineer football team for a couple weeks, a little trial run for 6'10", 285, Jimmy Bell Jr., the man's played a little bit of football. That can't be shocking to anybody that Jimmy Bell has a football background. And he goes from playing WVU basketball last season to still possibly playing WVU basketball and also possibly playing WVU football. I don't think I've ever seen this. Remember, Jared Brown did the Hey, I quarterback the basketball or the football team, and I'll play for Bob Huggins. So Huggins has done it the other way. This would be the first time in my knowledge that he's went the opposite way and sent a guy to the football team. Two weeks, offensive line, possibly tight end. Can you imagine six foot ten, two eighty five, Jimmy Bell running a route? Imagine having to cover that. I mean, it's not – I I don't know how you do that. Uh, it seems like a long shot. Let's be very clear. Jimmy Bell has not played football in quite a while. Uh, but let's see how it pans out. Word on the street as a possibility in this finagling of having scholarship guys on – the basketball team that aren't necessarily counting towards the 13 scholarships. If the Jimmy Bell experiment works and if Neil Brown gives him a scholarly, then 
Jimmy Bell stays on the basketball roster, contributes how he can as a pseudo scholarship player for basketball, but get it in football. And it opens up another slot for another guy from the transfer portal to come in to contribute for WVU. Again, long shot. Don't see that happening. If it's if it's how that ends up, not shocking. Bob Huggins is moving. Bob Huggins is shaking. And why would it stop there? Before, you know, is Pat Subnick trying to get a goalkeeper role with the soccer team? Get a scholarly. Is Kobe Johnson going to go out for wrestling? Get a wrestling scholarly. I don't know. Everything's in play. Why? Because Bob Huggins is moving and Bob Huggins is shaking. You can teach this old dog new tricks. <laughs> Jimmy Bell playing football. If he plays offensive line, he's tall for an offensive lineman. Make no mistake about it. Whatever he does, he's tall. A little spelt, if we're being honest, a little spelt for the offensive line. The coaches there have got to be like, Jimmy, we like what we see. Uh, got to gain some weight. You know how you lost all that weight? <laughs> you want to play football? I need you to bulk up. I need I need the first number to be a three. So uh, and still be fast, and still be able to block. You know. And I don't want to speak for Jimmy Bell. I can tell you from my lifetime experience, nobody's ever asked me to gain weight. If somebody did. I could knock it out of the park. <laughs> so I don't want to speak for Jimmy Bell, but if somebody asked him to do that, I would say that he would be able to oblige. You know what I mean? I'm guessing with respect. So that's the weird moving and shaking. The normal moving and shaking that's happened in the last few weeks in the month of April are two new additions from the transfer portal. And, and I would consider both splashes. Let's start with the point guard. First week of April, 6'3 guard Kerr Cresha joins WVU from Arizona. Kerr started 70 games for the Wildcats in his three seasons there. True point guard led the Pac-12 in assists per game last season. Lots of turnovers, but because he had so many assists, it ends up being two to one assist turnover ratio, which is what you're aiming for. And I bet that can improve. He also led the Pac-12 and made threes last season, 83 threes. To give you a comparison point, Eric Stevenson made 78. So Kerr had five more threes than Eric Stevenson, but Kerr took 21 more threes than Eric. Think about how many threes Eric shot last season. Add 21. That's how many. That's what Kreish is doing. That's where he's looking to get his shot off. That three-point line behind that, that's where he likes to shoot. Not a mid-range guy. Eric Stevenson, mid-range guy. Kirk Kreish, nope. <laughs> it's all threes. Three-fourths of his shots for Arizona were from three last season different system arizona likes to go up and down uh so maybe that changes but i don't think it's going to be and kurt is a point guard but i bet he could play off ball you could totally see a situation where kerr joey t playing together as one one of them starts one doesn't but you're watching the game like wow there's a lot of kerr and joey t playing together could totally see that and if that's the trade-off if it's a Kedrian's gone let's bring in Kerr obviously you lose defense obviously you lose trips to the free throw line but you're gaining what you didn't have from Kedrian which is I'll shoot so many threes and make 37 percent of them which is always welcome in the game of basketball shoot a bunch of them and not be terrible at it, we'll take it. And so again, I don't know Kerr's role. Jose is coming in and Omar is coming in and those guys play off ball, but you've got four guards with two starting spots 
We'll see what that looks like. Or maybe there's three spots because really it's just one Josiah left that would play three. And so maybe Jose or Omar fits there and you can have all three of those guys starting. But big pickup, major move, major shakeup, <laughs> bringing Kirk Kreisha. And so then the second pickup is, is literally big. Jesse Edwards, 6'11", four-year guy at Syracuse. Right, a center. <laughs> hey, Josh, I'm looking at the roster. I remember watching this uh, WVU play, and didn't they have three centers? <laughs> is there another spot? that Are we good with three centers? Here's the argument that we're not good with three centers. Are you ready? Jesse Edwards was a double-double last season, 15 and 10 average for the season when you combine jimmy mo and james stats those three combined were good for 11 points a game and 12 rebounds a game so one guy is putting up the stats of three again different systems different places but just on stat lines you're getting one for the you're getting one for the price of three that's a good reason. Jesse Edwards, 81 blocks last season. Jimmy Moe and James combined for 51 blocks. Good reason. Jesse Edwards shoots, you know, Kerr, he shoots 20 some feet from the basket. Jesse Edwards wants to be touching the rim with his hand when he shoots the ball. You know what I mean? You watch the package the highlight package for Jesse Edwards and it's dunks. It's alley oop dunks. It's Jesse Edwards sealing a guy going over the top dunk. So many dunks. As you can imagine, six eleven guy, right? The thing I like when I see him dunk is I like how he seals and I also like how he has no problems keeping the ball above his head. He's six eleven. He's not bringing it down to gather it and then going back up. He's keeping it above his head. The, the the lowest amount of motion he can use to get the ball dunked into the basket. That's what he does. If you give it to him and he's not facing the basket, he'll just flip it behind his head and dunk it reverse. I like the the efficiency of his motions of getting the ball immediately into the basket with the dunk. Great pick and roll player. You could totally see Kerr and you could totally see Joey T lobbing it up to Mr. Jesse Edwards. I like all of that. Like the glimpses you saw of Joey T throwing it up to Mo Wagi and to Okonkwo Edwards has lots of reps doing that okay so yeah we have three centers this guy you if he's available and he can come here that's a great addition it doesn't matter to have four centers and work it out you know what i mean can Oconquo go to four maybe can you play Woggy <laughs> and edwards together i'd like to see it i don't think that's out of the realm of possibility I mean, you could you could go two guards, Mitchell at the three, Mo and Edwards. I'm not insane to say that. Maybe I am. Who's to say? Here's the glass half empty position on Jesse Edwards. Uh, as great as his stats look, and as great as his highlights look, he plays in a lesser conference. <laughs> he plays in that in that. In that, uh, what is it called? The Athletic Coast Conference. And in, based on last year solely, it's just a lower level of basketball. You know what I mean? <laughs> it's not exactly the same questions of like Damon Kerrigan jumping up from Florida International. But how, how different is it? If you're really thinking about it, I mean, I don't want to take away from Jesse Edwards performances and 
again, the the highlight reel is fantastic. He put up a 27 and 20 in the ACC tournament last season, but he did it against Wake Forest, who was considered like good for the ACC, did not make the NCAA tournament. Edwards had a 22 and 16, but it was against a terrible Notre Dame team. All I'm saying is take the stats with with a grain of salt because of the competition based solely on last year. You you ACC friends of mine, you have a great historic basketball conference. (laughs) But if you just looked at 2022, 2023, you know, not great. The other glass glass half empty position, uh, Jesse Edwards, again, had 81 blocks. Jesse Edwards played in the Syracuse 2-3 zone in the middle. Did he ever go past the three-point line to guard anybody? Probably not. Was he really close to the basket and he was 6'11"? Now, he has gifts as far as being able to block shots. It's not a guarantee that if you play the middle of a 2-3 zone, you're going to get a ton of blocks. Uh, but it definitely helps the cause. You know what I mean? <laughs> Never had to come out of the paint. I'm assuming. So how will he do? How will he do playing man to man? Will Edwards change Huggins' defensive strategy? Who's to say? The he's great in offensive pick and roll. How will he do with defensive pick and roll? Where West Virginia has struggled with that position, guarding pick and roll at the top of the key. I don't know, but w- all that being said, I give you the glass half empty positions. I'm not glass half empty on Edwards. I say, if you've got three centers and he wants to come here, you got four centers. That's a good move. I think he starts. He has one season to shine in, in Morgantown. And I think he's going to be a great addition. Not good a great addition to the Mountaineers. Are you on the Twitter? Are you still on the Twitter? I'm on the Twitter. Follow me on Twitter at I'm Josh Witt at I am J O S H W H I T T post information about the show post things about WVU basketball, other things check that out also unreasonable doubt under the smoking musket umbrella so go to smokingmusket.com follow the smoking musket on twitter at smoking musket listen to west by pod another smoking musket podcast with jordan and joel do those things twitter west virginia non-conference schedule is set And on paper, a lot of changes from last year. The SEC challenge goes away. Different. It looks like when you're in the gauntlet, you stay in the gauntlet of Big 12 play. No Thanksgiving games. (laughs) No 1 a.m. finishes in Portland on Thanksgiving night. No... Uh, no true on-campus road games. There's games away from the Coliseum, but not at another school's home campus court. Nine home games in all. The season starts Monday, November 6th versus Missouri State. So just a little breakdown for each of these games. Missouri State, obviously, that's the Lamont West transfer revenge game. <laughs> Missouri State, not good at basketball. That's what we cling on to. We get revenge for Lamont West finishing his collegiate career there. Then West Virginia plays Monmouth, and they weren't good last year, and they're Monmouth. Then they play Jacksonville State. Jacksonville State, they weren't very good last year, and, spoiler alert, not in Florida. They should be the Jacksonville, Alabama State, whatever they are. But as they stand, if you're going to keep it Jacksonville State, then your mascot has to be like the misleaders. (laughs) 
Then West Virginia goes to Fort Myers, Florida for the Fort Myers tip off. And in that, you don't know how it's going to work, but the other three teams, so a four team tournament versus the eight last year, you get SMU, the ponies or the Mustangs, whatever, four legged kind of like a horse, you get the Virginia Cavaliers and you get the Wisconsin Badgers. So not the Phil Knight Classic, but you can't do the Phil Knight Classic every year. That's a lot. My guess is the schedule's not out on who West Virginia would play first there. I'm going out on a limb here and guessing that West Virginia will not play Virginia first. I think they're going to get the Mustangs or they're going to get the Badgers. But the West Virginia connection in Fort Myers, Isaac McNeely, who played for Polka, plays for Virginia. So that'd be fun. There's no revenge there. Just a West Virginia connection. West Virginia comes back home. Big East, Big 12 battle. West Virginia plays the St. John's, whatever they're called now. What are they? The Storm. The Red Storm. And that 100% is a Rick Pitino revenge game. And pick the revenge. And and just say it to yourself why West Virginia would want to get revenge against Rick Pitino. Why anybody would get revenge against Rick Pitino. Then West Virginia plays Pittsburgh. And that's considered a brawl. And possible football revenge game <laughs> is going to come after the football game. Possible now. This is the rare one. the The possible Jimmy Bell football basketball brawl sweep. The basket. Who has the backyard brawl sweep in basketball and football? It could only be Jared Brown in my lifetime. But that's on the table as of this recording. It's on the table. West Virginia stays in Morgantown to play the Drexel Dragons. It's always fun playing dragons. West Virginia Connection, Zach Spiker is from Morgantown. So you get Drexel. Then you leave the Coliseum to go to back to the Hall of Fame. Did you know that Bob Huggins is a Hall of Fame basketball coach? He's in there. He's got an orange jacket. Google it. So he comes back to Springfield. I hope he wears the orange jacket during the game. And West Virginia will play Massachusetts. And so the connection there, obviously, West Virginia's head basketball coach is in the Basketball Hall of Fame. Also, Frank Martin. And then you come back to Morgantown to play Darius Nichols' Radford team, the Darius Nichols homecoming again as a coach. Then you get Toledo. Toledo's interesting because they're good at basketball. They've won three straight Mac regular season championships. What that's translated to is zero Mac conference tournament championships and thus zero NCAA tournament appearances. Even though they've been, both are true. They've been really good at basketball, can't win the Mac tournament. So that'll be a fun game. Toledo has a fun style. And then the last non conference game as of this. Recording, West Virginia is going back to Cleveland. Recently announced Ohio State playing in Cleveland. And of course, this has happened before. West Virginia has played Ohio State in Cleveland. And as I recall, Deuce McBride did a shoulder shrug and also West Virginia won that game. So can you go into Cleveland two times in a row and beat the Buckeyes. Uh, We're going to find out. On paper, this is a more manageable non-conference schedule than last season. One more home game, no basketball giant on the schedule. Past performance doesn't guarantee future results, but only two teams on the schedule made the NCAA tournament last season. And you might not even play one of those. You're going to play Pittsburgh. They did make the NCAA tournament. You may not catch Virginia, but those are the two. 
West Virginia went 11 and 2 in the non conference last season with an on paper tougher non conference schedule. 11 and 2. This is not the team. What what West Virginia has now might not be the roster come November, but eleven and two right now seems doable. Seems a little easier in the non conference, and given where they're at with all the moving and shaking, they have a decent chance that they can do better than eleven and two. Again, on paper, and it's April. <laughs> So I'm real confident trying to give you a prediction on how they're going to fare in the non-conference, given that we don't know if this is the exact team. And it's April. All of the variables are still in play. But it's April. And I'm in Raleigh, North Carolina, and it's late, and it is the city that never sleeps. That's what they say about Raleigh. That's it for this episode of Unreasonable Doubt. Listen to all the platforms, or just pick one. Apple Podcasts, Spotify Podcasts, Overcast, Pocket Cast, YouTube. Is Pocket Cast a thing? I think it is. I use Pocket Cast. Until next time, I'm Josh Witt. This has been Unreasonable Doubt. WVU for the 2022-2023 season. They had 19 wins and they had 15 losses.
Are you on the Twitter? Unreasonable Doubts on the Twitter. Find stuff about the podcast and other takes that aren't on the podcast on Twitter at I'm Josh Witt. I am J O S H W H I T T. Check it out. The Twitter.